We spend far too much time worried about what makes us different than the next person or better than the next person and not enough time thinking about why we should respect the next person. We all have a story, an overarching theme that runs through our lives and makes us who we are. The problem is, we think that since each of our stories is different, there's not a lot of perceived value or shared struggle. But we have far more in common than we can imagine, and what motivates one person can certainly help us as well. The Third Lab Podcast is about understanding, respecting, and appreciating the struggle that it takes to overcome immeasurable odds in order to reach your destiny. Join me as I interview and bond with some of the most inspiring and incredible people, diving into their why to get a full understanding of their being. Without each other, we have nothing. So let's go on this adventure together and take on the future with open minds and open hearts. Welcome to the Third Lap Podcast. So welcome to episode three of the Third Lap Podcast. I'm really excited today because I get to connect with another one of my brothers. So episode one with Sharif. Um, episode three is my man Hatcheris. And so, you know, this dude right here, man, uh, this is my brother right here. So I couldn't wait to get a chance to connect with him and really give, give him a chance to talk about his story and his pathway to where he is and talk a little bit more about where he's going. But Hat, what's going on with you, man? How's everything? Yes, sir. It was good, Brody. I miss you, man. Miss you too, bro. It's been a minute, man. You know, it's good to connect with you. Um, You know, we had a good chance to talk yesterday before the episode. So, you know, I'm glad that we now getting a chance to take some of the conversations that we've had and, you know, record it and and get it out here to the people. Every time I call Hat, the first thing Hat say to me is talk to me nicely. Talk to me nice. (laughs) (laughs) Straight like that. And, you know, it's funny because I do talk spicy sometimes. And so I can't even start like... (laughs) is not deserved but i told my wife that the other day and she started dying so you know i feel like we should tell the people you know we we got a real strong relationship man i love this dude right here like a brother a little brother to me dude for real so you know we met um about five years ago when i was a teacher fellow at schools man it's crazy how much that how time has flew by it it might have been more than that honestly i think it was like six bro yeah because yeah it probably was because it was right when i moved to new york and so i've been out in philly three so yeah about that. Wow. Yeah. I don't fly, bro. So yeah, when we met, it was through citizen schools. Um, you know, I was I had just moved to New York and Hat was actually one of the first people I clicked with out there. Um and so, you know, we we built a relationship from that point. We've been rocking for a long time. We used to pull up to this homies building it and spit bars in the lobby and the stairs. Uh, real hood rat stuff. Real yeah, hood you, already, stuff. you already know how I go down, man. <laughs> That's that's a whole different iteration. But, you know, we we've been able to see each other grow. Um, you artistically, me professionally, also you professionally over these past several years. And so it's been dope, man. But uh, yeah, tell me how, how you feeling today, bro? How's it how's it feel to be a father? Congratulations. You know, how's it feel? Bro, how you feeling right now? I'm blessed and highly favored, man. Like it's, it's, it's something I got to wrap my brain around a lot. Like sometimes I wake up in the morning and just look at him and be like, damn, like. I got a son, you feel me? Like, that's something that, like, you don't really, like, you you could prepare yourself for it, but you can't really prepare yourself for it. So it's like every day is just a new experience, and he's growing every day, and it's almost like I'm looking at a new person every single day, so I'm just adjusting to it, and I'm happy to be here, you feel me? Yeah, that's a blessing, man. You said he's two months old today, so that's a beautiful today. thing. Yeah, and, you know, I got to say, I love seeing the pictures of you on social media with him just laying on your chest. My dad actually has a picture that he took with me laying on his. I was maybe like five or six months. And so, you know, I feel like that's that real father son moment to connect right there. Everybody got that picture, man. So that's yeah. one of those things you'll be able to share with him when he older and just showing that rapport. Like, you know, it's been a blessing again to just see you mature and grow over these past couple years. We met each other. I was yeah. a savage. I, I, I wasn't with none of that. I wasn't with none of that. And it's just funny how, how you know, you evolve. You know, you, you experience different things. Um, you go through your life challenges and whatnot, and that's a part of it. And you either grow from it or, or you get defeated. And my mama ain't raised no loser, you feel me? So it's like, I got to just keep growing, keep going. Yeah, that's straight like that, man. That's the whole purpose of this podcast is to talk about, you know, that growth and evolution, right? Like, we go through things, that's but fact. all it did was make it stronger. You know, like Jay said, pressure bust pipes, but it also made diamonds. Life that made diamonds out of both of us, bro, real talk. And so, 
Uh, you know, I want to give you a chance to rep your hood, man. Where you from? <laughs> Harlem. So to me, nice. What's up? It's thriving. You feel me? Like, I know, like, one of the reasons why we connected, too, is because we was the only ones from up top around there. Like, you know what I mean? When we first met you, some Jersey, you was talking crazy. And I'm from Harlem. I came in there thinking I was God's gift to everybody. You feel me? Like, so you got to get in tune or get lost. You know what I mean? Like, that's how I was giving it up. But I was in a professional setting, so my boy Malcolm pulled me to the side. I was like, yo, this is how you got to move in these spaces. And it's like, I appreciate that, because I didn't know that. Like, right. You know what I mean? Like, I came straight from the streets low-key. Like, I'm hood adjacent, because I ain't right. going jack. Like, I came straight from the I didn't. I grew up very well. But, right. like, at the same time, I, I was placing myself in certain environments in which I didn't know how to conduct myself in other environments. You know what I mean? So I really appreciate you for, like, seeing something in me at that time and, like, just, just taking me under the wing real quick, like, yo, come here. Let me highlight you real quick, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Because I would have been crazy out there. Yo, it's mandatory, man. Same with me, bro, hood adjacent, you know what I mean? But we made yeah. choices that put us in the hood and put us in the, in the yeah. field and all that and the thick of it. And so, you know, it was funny, like, right when I was transitioning to become a more professional version of myself, I'm mm -hmm. meeting you, and so I'm trying to put you on what I had learned, what, you know, other homies had put me on to help me get better. And so it was mandatory, bro. Whenever you see somebody that's a real one, if you're not building with them like that and you're not trying to help them grow and prosper, then what you really doing? What son, you right? doing? That's a fact. You paid it for it, and I appreciate that. And that, and honestly, like, me, me, and you changed my insight on a lot of things, Brody. And it's like, I, I don't call you enough and tell you that. So especially on your podcast, I want to just let yeah. you know that you a stand-up dude, bro. Like, and I really appreciate and like a lot of people that listen don't really know the number of lives that you've touched in such a short time and the difference that you've made in not only children but also like professionals bro because it's like with what you do now you know what i'm saying like i love it bro like that was just it was just full circle i appreciated that man yo i appreciate you for that though and you know I'm, I'm glad that we now have these platforms to be able to do even more for our community and put That's more people fun. on and you know why i felt it was mandatory to even get out here and start recording some of this stuff is because some of this get lost in translation right like some of these conversations just stay between two parties and some things need to stay between us and private right not being yeah. recorded some of that yeah, we ain't some of it you know what i mean we need to put on wax so that the people can understand that everybody can learn and grow together, man. So, you know, my man, Heart Hatcher's from Uptown, from Harlem. Um, I used to give him a <laughs> tough time about it, but I used, to, I used to pop through there all the time, man, whenever I got yeah, you chance, pulled up you know, a man. couple times, yeah, was bro. Up there, bro. You pulled up, and we was, was, up we, there. was, we was playing a block, too. Like, we wasn't even, we ain't had nowhere to go. <laughs> you already know, bro. You already know how we get it. I hear about that. Yeah, that. you already know, man. You know, you, you could be professional, but you also got to be who you really are, bro. And, you know, sometimes some staircases and the rap sessions is really what it is. So, you know, we multifaceted, bro. That's the main thing. As we, we talked about, you know, how we met, we definitely got a chance to reflect on where you're from. And so, you know, I, I really want people to get a chance to know who who are you? How do you define yourself? If you had to give somebody a 30 to 60 second elevator pitch to describe Hattress, how would you do so? As Hattress, I, I would say that I am, I'm an emotional being and I like to, to use my emotions to tell stories about where I'm from, what I've been through, but not only where I'm from and what I've been through, what I see around me. And I'm an artist first. So it's like everything about me is creativity and I need to get out to the world and I'm a man of service. So it's like in any, and you know what's so crazy? I was thinking about this the other day. One of the things that kind of stuck out to me on my journey of poetry and when I'm thinking when I'm thinking like yo what am I what am I about to do next when I'm feeling defeated one of the things that you said to me actually you told me everything that I've experienced in every professional setting and every setting that I've been in prepared me for what I'm doing now it kind of was like a light bulb go off in my head cuz like I remember being young going into a classroom and trying to learn education, learn how to teach, learn how to reach these kids that look just like me and trying to figure out what their deficits are and get them there. You know better than I know like how those middle schoolers were. Like it's like, yo, if you wasn't yourself, they picking you apart. Right. But like so it, it was it was a tightrope that I had to walk in front of that audience. And going into recruitment and learning how to connect with every single person that I met, um, learning what their needs are, what their deficit is and what their gift is. And then matching them with the perfect opportunity for them so that they're happy. Um, and all of that translates to a stage. 
all of that translates to my writing. All of that translates to just the experience of being able to perform in front of people and make them feel something, right? Like, even if they've never been through it, make you feel something. And it's like, you telling me that kind of solidified that in my mind because I had mad doubt. But, like, just hearing that from an, an outsider of my mind, it was like, damn, like, all right, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing right now because, like, I already feel like that. But to hear someone say, like, yo, you went through these stages on purpose, even if you felt like you ain't know what you was doing at the time. Like, this is what you're supposed to be doing. So I, I appreciate you for that, first of all. But, like, that's who I am as a person. I'm an artist. Um, I'm a storyteller. I'm a father. I'm a lover. <laughs> I'm a professional. Like, it's just, I'm multifaceted, like you say. You feel me? All of those things. And you every last one of them things, bro. And every that's why last I love one you, bro. of them things. 100%. Really? That's why I love you for it, man. Um, and you know that we are just a, a manifestation of all of our experiences, right? Like, you know, we go through all these different things and these trials and these tribulations. And so many of us look at it the wrong way. Um, yeah. So many of us don't really see how it's getting us to where we need to go. Um, in episode one, my boy Sharif, King Sharif, talked about the fact that, like, we always talking about what are things doing to us and not for us? And my dad says that all the time. Like anytime I get into a situation, my pops is like, what is it doing for you, right? Versus what is it doing to you? And so one time we was conversing about it and it was one situation specifically where I was like, man, it's doing way more to me than it's doing for me. And he was like, exactly. And I'm like, Tch. Man, hit me with the Mr. Miyagi that's knowledge. A, you heard? That's a gym, bro. Hit like, me with you can't the Mr. Nothing after that. You like that was right. it. Exactly. That's all you I said. It. And I <laughs> and informed me how I needed to move from that moment, right? Because anytime it crossed that threshold of doing more to you than for you, you gotta leave it alone. And so you know that comes with knowledge, that comes with intuition, that comes with experience and wisdom. But yeah. also sometimes you just need to listen because people are gonna put you on game, right? You need to just peep what's happening around you. Life is putting you on game every single day. It's yeah. soaking it in and being a sponge and learning from those experiences or you becoming jaded to the process. Um, and if you becoming jaded, then you're not getting the message correctly. Yeah. I ain't gonna lie. I used to I used to think that I got to go through it to get through it. But it's like, nah, I don't necessarily have to go through certain things. If I just open my eyes and look around me, like, there's a lot of people going through certain things. I could learn from it. And that's one of... That's, at 31, that's what I'm trying to learn to do is like actually pay attention to everything that's going around me so that I don't have to go through certain things. You know what I mean? Like, cause that used to be right. my thing. I, I want to go through it. I don't need to go through it. I done been through enough. I don't need to go through no more. I just want to get yeah. through what I need to get through. Yeah, and, and that threshold of 30 is so important. When you get into your 30s, we we looked at it when we was young boys, like, okay. Like, you old, you watch when you old, you're 30. Yeah, yeah. But, like, yeah. I'm 35, and, like, you know, I was telling my wife yesterday, 30s, in my opinion, is the best decade of your life. Because it's like, I'm I'm young enough to still turn up with the little homies and still right. be ratchet, but I'm old enough to have my wits about me and the experiences that I've been through. So it's like, that's a dangerous being yeah. right there, because it's like, your potential is limitless at that point. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like, exactly. like it's the middle child. Like, like J. Cole said, I'm the middle child. Like, at the end of the day, I can go to the hood with the homies, give them game so that they be good, but I can also navigate in this professional realm that I'm in and then, and then like, kind of move up in there because I, I have the savviness, but I also have the knowledge to know, like, what I need to do. Like, I have to keep this going. You know what I mean? So it's right. like, that's where I'm at with it. You're listening to the Third Lap Podcast with Mal Davis. Yeah. We we reflected a little bit like we on how we met. We already chopping up game like usual, but you yeah. know, I really want to take a moment. That's what we do, man. That's why we had to get it on wax, bro. But so I want to give you a chance hat to talk about sort of how you started. So, you know, in regards to like your career, but really in regards to you as an artist because you are an artist, right? Like you have a professional career, you yeah. recruit. But in the end of the day, like we talked about yesterday, like in my opinion, like your art is your is your craft. Your art is who you are. Your art is innately what defines you. And so talk to us about like, how did you start on this pathway? How did you even identify that poetry and rhyming and rap and, you know, all of the, the spoken word, the things that you now do, um, were the things that matter to you the most? I think that poetry has been the only consistency in my life, right? Um, so like when I was younger, I was probably, I think the first time I ever wrote a poem, I probably had to be like 10, 11. 
And this was during the time that they had um, Deaf Poetry Jam. And I was watching that in the crib. And I remember that I remember that day like it was like I wrote it on a yellow notepad, one of the big joints. And I had watched Deaf Poetry. I saw Black Ice. He was a prominent poet. And he was spitting. And it was just something about his choice of language, which was still poetic. But then the grittiness in his voice and just like it, he reminded me of me. You know what I'm saying? Well, I re- I felt like I was him because it's like, you know, he was a little older, whatever the case may be, but this is a person on, on national television, on an HBO syndicate show, and he's talking like me. He's getting acclaimed for it. And that was something that I've never seen before besides, like, rappers or, you know what I'm saying, like, rappers and things like that. But, like, he's doing poetry and he's using figurative language and, and he's telling an emotional story. And, like, I fell in love. Um, and literally, like, that same night, I wrote my first ever poem. It was to my unborn daughter. I didn't have, I wasn't even thinking about kids at that time. But you feel mm. me? But, like, I guess I was. So, like, that was the first poem I ever wrote. And then I realized that, like, you know, poetry is not the wave when you 10, 11, 12, you know, like, in the culture that we grew up in. So that that was something that I kept dear to me. I kept secret. I didn't really advocate for it. I didn't really go hard for it. But that's something that stuck with me my entire life. Um, and then that's something that transformed into my therapy. Um, so when I would go through certain situations when my mother died, when I had a bad relationship, when other people passed away in my life, or when I felt abandoned and I felt like I couldn't talk to nobody. And I didn't, you know, in the Black community, therapy is it's a new thing. Yeah. Therapy is a new thing, but like coming up, the, the number one thing my family was like, yo, you crazy? You know what I mean? And it's like, that kind of makes the person ashamed to even express themselves in that way. Um, so the page was was my therapist and it's been with me my entire life. So how did I get to performing? Because like, that's a big jump. Cause it's like, there's a difference between writing poems at four o'clock in the morning in your crib by yourself and then going on stage and bearing your soul and all your scars and bleeding in front of people. You feel me? Like that's, there's a certain yeah. level of vulnerability that, um, that takes. And to be totally honest, it wasn't my decision. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It wasn't, I got the nerves now I'm going to do this. Nah, it was literally one of my homegirls, um, who, knew that I wrote because like we were we were close enough for me to share that type of stuff for her and she had read some of my work um and that was somebody that I respect a lot too and I still respect to this day because like she's really about change she's really about organization she has like two nonprofit organizations in which she helped women um and it was just a blessing to meet someone like that because we were like minds of service like we just wanted to help where we're from um and literally she was like, yo, get in the car. I was like, all right, cool. Where we going? I'm thinking we going to turn up. I'm thinking we going to the club, blah, blah. <laughs> she took me to New York Rican Cafe, bro. And when she took me to New York, I didn't, I'd never been on a poetry scene before. I didn't know what was going on. She was like, yo, this is a, this is, this is a poetry slam, bro. I was like, all right, cool. I want to watch. She put my name on the list and then told me. Right? So it's like. I'm sitting there like, all right, cool. I'm just watching poets perform, blah, blah. Next thing I know, I hear my name. And I look at her. And she like, yo, you heard him. <laughs> and I was like, oh, all right. So I go up. And at that time, I think she did it because she knew I was kind of like contemplating hitting the stage and then not hitting the stage. And I was getting nervous. I wasn't going. I would go to certain events, but like not say that I do poetry. Um... And she knew I've been rehearsing this one poem because she heard it. I've been rehearsing this one poem over and over again. It was trash, by the way. But I've been rehearsing this one poem over and over again. And she knew I had at least something I can do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I went up there and I did that poem, bro. And it's like, because she had so much faith in me, like I felt like I couldn't let her down. It was like, nah, like you really drove me all the way out here. We downtown, we came from the Bronx all the way downtown to LES. And you drove me out here and you you did this. So it's like, I'm not even going to disappoint you right now because I respect you so much. So it's like, I'm going a, I'm to a hit them with this poem. I hate, it th- I hate the poem now, but like at the time it was cool. Like, you know what I'm saying? This was like three, four years ago. You're listening to the Third Lap Podcast with Mal Davis. Yeah.
I didn't really make a transition into actually seeing myself as an artist until like I started putting the work in. Cause like after I hit the stage the first time, I didn't like it. So because I didn't like it, I was like, nah, I gotta get to the point where I actually like my content. You know what I'm saying? Cause then like I'm sure my performance will be better because it's like it's nothing you can say to me anymore because it's like I like this. Like I'm doing this for me. This is my therapy. Um, so I literally just like made that my goal. My goal was to like, yo, like I'm about to take over the scene. Me and you are kind of similar. Like literally when we put something in our head, like, yo, this is what I'm about to do. Like there's not nothing that can stop that. Like th that's what's happening. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and it's like, you either get with it or you get lost. That's it. So it's like for the last three years, it was like trying to figure out okay, I'm about to be real G-unit with this. Like, I'm about to take over New York City. And luckily, I've been able to meet a lot of good people who can help me, and I've been able to better my craft and, like, talk to people who I admire and even put me on game. And it's like, I've been doing quite decent on it. You know what I mean? Like, and, and I'm happy that just the things that I can say can touch someone and they can relate and they can feel like they're not so alone because that's ultimately what I do it for. I do it to, to other people so they can feel like they're not alone in the situations that they've been through like there's nothing new under the sun and you ain't no Allen. you feel me like i'm just gonna put it in a way that you can feel it and you don't feel isolated no more because like that's the worst feeling bro to feel isolated like nobody understands what you're going through like that's the wackest thing in the world and i don't want nobody to feel like that you you said a couple of things that i just want to touch on real quick um the first was around like the mental health of like suffering in silence um yeah. and that's something that i want to see deprioritized in the black community, right? Like I want to see mental health destigmatized. You can't pray everything away. You're not going to always go no, to salvation fact. through Jesus and through religion. Like, you know, there are mental health professionals that are professionals that have studied this and gotten their degrees and they tie them in for a reason. Um, and as a person that, you know, when I was diagnosed with clinical depression at 15, um, like talk therapy, was the thing that helped me the most. It wasn't the medication I was on. The medication made me a robot, right? Like, you know, I've been in that place where I felt alone. I felt by myself. I felt that no. I had nobody I could turn to, you know? And I ultimately, you know, but we all go, it's like what you said, you know, we're we not an island necessarily. And so now as a, as a man, I've prioritized talk therapy. I've prioritized making sure that my mental health and well being is in a good place because if it's not, I can't be my best self. And so anybody that's listening to this podcast, you know, I encourage you and I'm sure Hatchers does as well to make sure that you're doing the things that you need to to keep your mental health in a great place. Um, but you know so crazy, bro? Not to cut you up. I just no, want to name it. I just want to name it because it's like it's funny that you said that because it triggers something in me because it's like, you know how like we like to tell our story real gloriously. Right. But it's like one of the reasons why I started going so hard for poetry and like hitting stages and performing wasn't because I wanted to be my best self, but because I literally had a mental breakdown. Right. And like, I literally checked myself into a hospital and realized that's not where I'm supposed to be because we were sitting there watching Maury and everybody was drugged up and they were trying to push me drugs and tell me I'm suicidal. And I'm like, damn, this is not helping me either. But right. I just want to do talk therapy. Like, I already knew what I needed um, because like, the mental health industry is a beast in itself. You gotta, mm -hmm. you gotta also know, especially as a black person, you gotta know how to mm -hmm. maneuver that. Right. Um, but it's funny how I left that out, right? And it's like, to this day, I'm still a little uncomfortable with it. You know what I'm saying? Like, and that's just the reality of it because it's like I'm so used to not speaking about these things. I'm I'm a little bit more comfortable on the stage yeah. and like sharing a poem about it. But I wrote that poem. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, but it's a difference in conversation. And it's like, thank you for saying that because it just triggered me. And I'm like, oh, I really left that out. Did I leave that out on purpose? What was the, mm -hmm. like, you know what I mean? Like, what was the reason behind leaving that out? But I mean, I it's, it. it's funny. I appreciate you. And, you know, maybe two years ago, I came to the realization that I had a mental breakdown at the end of high school, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, I, it took me five years to graduate high school. And I tell my story because I, I know that there are people like myself 
that need to hear it. You know, 1.8 GPA when I graduated took me five years. My grandmother died before I got a chance to finish. And all she mm-hmm. ever wanted to do was see me graduate high school. And so when she passed away, that's when my life went left, right? Like mm-hmm. with depression, I, I lost all my faith in God and I lost all my faith in my family due to just the fallout from my grandmother passing away and things that transpired after that. And like, I really realized that I had a whole mental breakdown. And, you know, it wasn't until I'm a grown man and I'm in a better place in a better situation and I'm going through this self-reflection. And actually, it was a Tiffany Haddish stand up where she was talking about she had like three mental breakdowns in her life. And she like went through each of them. And as she's doing it, it, it really saying what you were saying right now. It triggers something in my subconscious to make me go back to that time and really mm-hmm. look at it more realistically and name it. It's important that I name it. I had a mental mm-hmm. breakdown. Right. Like I was not who I was supposed to be. Things happened. I lost my path, but I was able to get my way back only because I claim it. And so, yes, we can't hide who we are. We can't hide yeah. what we've been through. Ain't no way yeah. we're going to learn from anything that we're trying to hide from the outside world. And that's the great thing about art. That's why I love art. That's why I love what you do and what you have become, because you now live your experiences out loud and other people can live their lives vicariously through what you're doing. If they're scared to name it for themselves, they know it's at least one other person that went through that same thing. That's the, I ain't gonna hold you like that is the best feeling in the world. Like, I don't care if I'm gonna get no followers. I don't care if I get paid for this show, but like to know that like people hit me up later, like, yo, that poem you did about your mother, like I felt that. Like I lost my moms at the, you know what I mean? Like, and it's like, yo, I haven't talked to nobody about that. So it's like, if it's, if it's one thing that I, I love, it's just the connection, the kinship that comes with the poetry. Um, cause it's like, I'll be feeling like my Instagram fam, that's my family because it's like, I have real dialogue with these people and I don't, I've never met them before, but it's like, we in the DMs really talking about life, you know what I'm saying? Like, and really like establishing real relationships. And it's like, that's, you can't, it can't get no better than that. Because like, how many people, you know, that you have surface level relationships with, like mm-hmm. you just talk about the weather with, right. Yeah. And then it's like, I have a whole community in which I know I can lean on. Like I have a whole family, like, you know what I mean? Like, and it's just a beautiful thing. That's why I love social media to a little bit, because like sometimes yeah. I get crazy. But like right. that part of social media is something that I, I just love and, and appreciate. And it's funny how like strangers support you more than the people that you know do. Oh, that's and, a fact. And that's, that's the thing I, fact. I think that through social media and just through, you know, me rapping previously and like now with this podcast and just the amount of support that I've gotten before I've even really gotten to a point where like this is really hitting the ground and gaining traction but people are already showing love that like i don't really know like that but it's people that you know i grew up with it's family members i don't even talk to any longer because we've had fallouts and disconnects behind things that have happened and you know it's crazy how to your point like it's them random strangers that made that soul it's a soul connection right like we could talk sports and movies and music all day long but like have we made a soul connection have mm-hmm. we connected on a on a, a really deep and meaningful level and then have we built on it and that's how our relationship started is like we built on a meaningful you know conversation and then communicated and you know initially it was four of us and you know from that four yeah. it was down to just me and you yeah. and you know it's it's crazy how that works because Sometimes you got to eliminate the noise to get to what you really need to do. Yeah, and, you know, the other right. two folks, no disrespect to them, but like they weren't on the timing that we were on. And so, yeah. you know, you and I continue to rock out in a way that I don't communicate and, and rock out with either of them any longer because Vice versa. Our, our, yeah, <laughs> so, our connection yeah. wasn't that deep, you yeah. know. And so talk to me a little bit about like some of the struggles as far as where you are now. Right. So, you know, you've you made that gigantic leap and shout out to your homegirl who basically bamboozled you into getting out there in New York region. But like you need that initial yeah, push, right? Like I had that's how I started rapping is so my homie put a beat on. He was like, I know you could spit, spit, killed it. And from that point on it gave me the confidence I needed to keep going. But I remember the first time I ever rapped, I was 16. My little cousin, I was like 17, my little cousin heard me spit JR. I love that man. It's my brother. And he Turned to me, he was like, yo, that was whack. Yo, I think I was talking about <laughs> missile launcher. He was like, you ain't got no missile launcher. And, you know, I learned <laughs> I learned so much from that moment because it was also back to being authentic. Authentic, when you, yeah. That's yeah, a people feel you. People know when you're faking it. What you said about the middle schoolers, you apply that to all of life. If you could walk through life being the best version and iteration of yourself constantly, 
you're going to attract the right people to you. When you're trying to be something that you're not, you're never going to get to where you're trying to go. You're always going to burn out at some point. I go to certain poetry spots and I see those poets who are good writers, right? But like, and not to say that every story you tell has to be your story because that takes away from the creativity aspect, right? But people can feel when this is not your story, right? And and it's like, it, it doesn't hit the same. So it's like, I try to tell stories, but I try to put myself in it because it's like, I can't really speak about things that I don't know. And it's like, that's that. And I feel like that's like the number one rule of a writer. It's like, yo, it, a lot of the things that you write, it has to come from a place in which you know. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you can't assume, you can't guess. Like, it has to be something that you know. Um, but back to the trials and tribulations and part of which, what you was talking about when it comes to like the support. Like that was my main beef, bro. Like I was, I was out here going crazy, screaming at the homies, like, "Yo, you don't come to no shows. I'm ready to fight." Like right. I'm like, "Yo, like, but you want me to support you? You want me to? You know what I mean?" And it's like I had to really realize, like, "Yo, like, it's not even about me no more." Like sometimes people have their own insecurities, and just seeing you live in your light and and walk your path. It makes them really look in the mirror at themselves. And that's something that they got to figure out. Because once a person is whole, they have no problem supporting other people in their journey. But when a person is incomplete and they see deficits, they get insecure. Um, and That's a so, word right there, brother. That's a whole nah, word you just said right there, talk, bro. Real talk. So I, I made the decision wholeheartedly to just surround my people, surround myself with people who, if they are not whole, they are... They are, understand the vision. They are, are they are on their own process of becoming whole. Because like I can't say that I'm whole, right? Like we all have holes, but at the same time, I know the destination. Now I'm figuring out how to get there, but I know my purpose. And like when a person doesn't know their purpose, it, it leaves room for all of these low frequency energies, like jealousy. That's a low frequency energy. Like, you know what I mean? Being unsupportive, not showing love, that's that's low frequency. So it's like, I just stay away. I try to keep my vibrations a little higher than that. Like So it's like, you can always tell where somebody at by the conversation that they have with you, right? So it's like, when you pull up in a room and y'all chatting and they start talking about other people, that's low frequency. Because now it's like, why are we gossiping? Like, what? What's going on with you? Like, what's your plans? Like, what's going on? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and so it's like, I just stay away from those type of people. And I always keep the people around me who either got a lot going on themselves and they focused on whatever vision that is, because that's motivation. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't want to be in a room with people and I'm the only person planning my five years out. What y'all doing then? What we doing? We can't do nothing together if I'm the only one with a five-year plan. You're in the wrong room at that point. Yeah, I'm in the wrong room. So it's yeah. like, I, I realize like just being around certain energies contributes to, to your success because it's like, I used to be tripping about support from people who I see every day, but then I can sell out a show from people on Instagram. And then it's like, do I need y'all at this point? Because it's like, if I just continue doing what I'm doing now and create the relationships I'm, I'm making... I don't even care if you come or not. Because at a certain point in time, you won't be able to come. And it's like, I can't do nothing for you. I just know it's going to get there. And I'm trying to tell them early, like, hey, it's about to go somewhere. Um, you could hop on now or, you know, not. That's how, that's where I'm at with it. But to go back to your point, I know I'm, I'm chatty. It's hard in the artistry, but I think the hardest thing is the life, right? Because it's like, you go through things in life. And when you have a vision and you have a goal, a certain part of you, you ha- you got to block that out and still keep your focus on, like, what the vision is. So, like, literally, like, during this journey of writing and, and trying to create a name for myself in New York and doing the performance aspects so of my goal is to write a book. So I've been writing this book for three years. And it's literally done. I haven't. And I, that's my fault for not even putting it out right now. But it's just so many situations in my life that has been occurring um, from losing my daughter last year to um, losing my father this year to having my son this year. It's just certain things that um, kind of puts things in pause. 
and you know, you know very well, like like with my father and my son situation, how that talk how that talk transpired. about that. I was actually going to ask you if you was open to you know communicating about that because yeah. the conversation we had where you came to that sort of epiphany of sort of the transition of your father and your son being born and how you had a chance to now redefine yourself as a father, unlike how your dad had been in your life. You know, I would love for you to expand on that because I feel like there's a lot of people out here that struggle with their relationships with their parents. Like, like I can't, yeah. I, I, you know, I've had those issues, but my parents have yeah. always been in my corner. But I know there'll be people that come across this, listen to this, and are going through that and think again, like I'm by myself. And, you know, what you told me about how you came to that realization and like what you learned from that experience was yeah. so profound to me that I would love if you'd be open to share that. Nah, of course. I, I want to backtrack real quick because like, I feel like I didn't do my daughter justice in this podcast. So it's like, I lost my daughter. Her name was Iman Adele Balboa. I lost my daughter last year in April. Um, I literally still wear her ashes around my neck just because like that was my baby. Um, but yeah, so I'm sorry like, for your loss too, bro. Not to interrupt you, but no, you know, no, no, we definitely talk no, no. about that too. That. And I'm sorry for your loss and your partner's loss for sure. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And 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 it's funny how God works, right? Because it's like, you know, you get your blessings tenfold after the fact. But I'm a person, so it it still it still hits. But um, I don't think if I didn't go through that situation, I would even be prepared to be a father right now. So I just. I just get into the fact that, like, literally, I had a real strange relationship with my pops. You know, like, we got the same name. You know what I mean? Like, his, he's Hatchers, I'm Hatchers. I'm the, I'm the third, he's a junior. And, like, he was always very distant. I lost my mother when I was 15. And I like to say that when I lost my mother, I lost my father, too. Because, like, I didn't live with him. I lived with my sister. I lost con- he, he didn't really try to contact me. He didn't, he wasn't really trying to be active in my life and I resented him for it. And I'm not the type of person that's not vocal. So I would always express how I'm feeling it. And we just didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things and he didn't get it. So he stayed away. So when he got sick, he tried to come around a little bit more, not come around, but like just reach out to me a little bit more. And at this time I'm, I'm 30. So I'm like, this is behind me. Right. Like you didn't teach me how to be a man. I had to learn how to be a man on my own. So I'm not going to fault you for it because I'm I'm a better man. But at the same time, I'm not going to go out my way for you because like you never went out your way for me. Um, so it is what it is. I can help you if you need help just because I'm a better person than you. But at the same time, I don't really want to do this. Um, so I really had to reflect. And while he was going through what he was going through, I was having difficulty because I knew I was having a son. And I was having difficulty trying to understand, like, can I be the same? Can I be a good father for my son? And I was doubting it because, like, when I was having my daughter, like, yeah, I was like, yeah, I'm so excited. I was raised by women. So it's like, that's all I know. Like, all I know is how to show her the type of love that she deserves and that she needs. But, like, when it comes to a, a raising a boy, raising a child, a child that's a boy, I didn't know if I was capable. Like, I don't even have too many male friends. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just, that's just not the energy that I move with. So it's like, that was something that was a, a insecurity of mine. And I was going through it. Like, talks with wifey all night about like, yo, can I do this? Crying, just like, you know, in addition to the other things that come with fatherhood, just being trying to understand, are you ready for it? Can you, can you mentally do this? Can you financially do this? Can you step up? Can you like, it's just so many different moving parts that you got to keep in your mind. Um, in addition to trying to be the best poet in the world, right. (laughs) Um, which is a lot. Uh, so one of the things that I said to you on the phone, I was like, yo, I think it was kind of a blessing that it panned out the way that it panned out. Cause my pops, my pops passed away in June. His funeral was June 20, 28th. My son was born July 15th. So as soon as I came back from the funeral, a week later, basically, I'm going to the hospital for my son. Um, during that time, I was also apprehensive about his name, because at first I wanted to name him Hatchers like me, because I'm the third, but then that was attached to my pops. And then I was like, damn, like I don't want 
I don't want these generational curses to be passed down because like I have a lot of my pops deficits. Um, I see a lot of the things that he did in me and it's like, I had to fight so hard. I still have to fight so hard to like, be like, nah, that's not the man that you're supposed to be and to be better than that. And, um, Honestly, and it, and it sounds weird saying, because like in hindsight, I had to look back and it's like, yo, I love my pops. Like he was my pops. You know what I'm saying? Like, and it's like we had a whole 15 years in which like, he did the best that he could, right? Um, and that's something that now as a man and as a father I can appreciate, but that doesn't take away from what he didn't do and how that affected me. Um, so just holding those two at the same time, I'm like. Yo, it kind of it kind of was a blessing because it's like it's almost like that was his last gift to me. Um because of everything I was going through, I wasn't sure if I was emotionally able to be there for my son. And that's a tough feeling. You know what I mean? Like to 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 feel like and even still to this day like I have to correct that. Like it's there's sometimes where it's like I feel myself being a little distant with a little hat and I got to be like, uh, uh-huh, come here. I love you. Like, you know what I mean? And just, just speak words of affirmation to him. Um, because of the fact that like, I didn't get that. And it's yeah. like, almost like, I don't even, I have to rewire my brain to be like, yo, this is what's supposed to happen. Regardless if you ain't get that or not, like, this is what's supposed to happen. This is better for your son, and you love your son, so you need to do that. But it was so crazy how I was, like, literally when they buried him, like, I just felt like a burden was off of me. And it's like I didn't feel tied to him. And I learned that, like, okay, he's not here no more. So everything with my name, my son name being named after me, he's named after me now. He's not named after my father. So everything that Hatches represents, I have to show him because he can't learn from him anymore or his absence or because he would have never learned from him. He would have learned from his absence, but he has no frame of reference at that point. So now I get to create who Hatches is and I get to instill that in him and I get to make sure he has pride in that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, because before I didn't have pride in that. I didn't have pride in my name. I right? thought you were joking when you told me that was your real name. That was I'm my like, real name. He's like, my bro. name Hat. And I'm like, man, that ain't your name, bro. You told me the whole job. I was like, wow, okay. Do your yeah. thing, though, son. It, so- right. it sounds prestigious, but it's like I had no pride in it. Um, and now my number one goal is to make sure that my son has pride in his name. Like, give him something to aspire to. And then be there for him for whatever it is he wants to do. And let him know that he can do it because he's my son. You feel me? Like, you're good. Because that's all we ever want, right? Like, we all we ever want. And honestly, and it's crazy because, like, I feel like that because of my mother. I feel like I could do whatever I want to do because of who my mother was. And, like, as a man, that's a little different, right? Like, you, you don't usually hear men say that. But, like, I know who my mother was. And she instilled in me who I am. And so regardless of what I've been through or when I slipped or whatever the case may be, like, in my heart of hearts, like, I know who I am. You know what I mean? So it's like, I just always want him to have that that unrelenting confidence in who he is and, like, so that he can do whatever he wants to do. And I'm going to be for him. Like, I'm going to be in his corner just shooting it up. Like, yo, what you trying to do? We going to get crazy. You know what I mean? Um, but, yeah, that's just where I'm at with it. You're listening to the Third Lap Podcast with Mal Davis. Yeah. Like I said, man, I was really moved when you shared that with me. And it, it makes me think about my dad who, you know, throughout my entire life. So my mom and dad made a conscientious choice to not name me Louis A. Davis the third because of the fact that my dad and his father, who passed away, had a very tumultuous relationship. Mm to put it lightly, right? Like, you know, my grandfather did my father dirty too many times to count. And so, you know, my dad made a conscientious effort to raise me and love me and affirm me and invest in me and teach me how to be a man and how to be a righteous man at that because he wanted to break that generational curse. Mm-hmm. And so it started with like, nah, your name won't be Lois, right? My middle name is Lois, but I'm not the junior, I'm not the third. And then it became... Throughout my entire life, my father has told me, 
you know, I made the choice to do something different. And so, you know, I'm excited to become a father. And when my wife and I do finally adopt, like I'm excited to become a father because I know that I get a chance to build on what my father has done. He set a hell of an example. And so for me, mm -hmm. I now get a chance to, like you said, even my son, when we adopt, will be named Malcolm Lewis Davis Jr. And so, you know, I get a chance to now define for him what that name means. And so what you said right now resonates so heavily with me as I project forward in my life because I know at some point, you know, God willing, I will have a son. And, you know, I want to set that example and I want to make sure that my son knows that and my daughter, too, when we have one, that she can do whatever on this planet. He can do whatever mm -hmm. on this planet because we've instilled those things in them. And so, you know, had like we we started off real ratchet beginnings, but, you know, as we <laughs> progress through yeah. this podcast, it's a manifestation and really a representation of how we've progressed through life, right? Like the That's different evolution. changes. That's a it's, fact. That's a it's fact. It's constant, son. It's constant. And so, you know, thank you for sharing that. I also want to talk to your experiences. You made a lot of headway and a lot of movement on social media. You started recording, you know, yourself doing poetry. Then you started recording yourself freestyling. And when we first started connecting, like freestyling wasn't really what you was doing. You wasn't mm -hmm. really as focused on it. You certainly didn't have, you had the skill, but didn't have the confidence. And so like yeah. that came a little bit later. And so I remember maybe like a year or two ago, I came across a post where you were spitting. And I was like, all right, it's about that time. Like, well, man, hey, let's get it. I've been waiting on it. Um, and so, you know, I would love for you to talk about that evolution too of like, how did you get to the point where you started really capitalizing on social media? Because we, before we even got on the podcast, I talked about my struggles with it. And so, you know, I've seen from you and I've learned a lot from your example of like how to put out dope content consistently and then have people consistently interact with it so that you build a real strong core foundation. So what went into that? How'd you even start developing that? And, and where are you going with that next? Yo, it's trial and error, honestly. So I, before I started doing like videos and stuff like that, I was like writing poetry on the gram. Like I had a poetry page, but I would like put selfies here and there and then write some poems. Um, it wasn't until I started taking poetry seriously where I'm like getting, trying to get booked for shows. Cause I, I used to hit like open mics three, four times a week just to practice, like just to be outside, just to meet people, just to do all that. And then I realized like, oh, the social media stuff is cool, but like, Y'all like me more when y'all meet me. I right, cool. So like, I got to hit every venue. I have to make sure that I actually know y'all. So it's like, that's really what it was. It was like understanding the social media game, understanding how to get traction, understanding that I'm going to have something to sell soon. And it's best if you have a core fan base. And I hate to say fan base. Like, if you have a core set of supporters who are invested in your journey and your plight, and what you have going on for you, um, that's just an easier time, right? And it helps in the product research because it's like all of this, all of this is advertising and branding. That's all it is. And it's like, you know, go cop a ring light, go cop. You know I mean, like, because we're all creative beings. Like, content, we come up with content and regular conversation. That's not nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think I got a bar, but I was like, um, TikTok still in our content, sell it for billions. You know what I'm saying? Because, like, the whole concept of TikTok right. is, like, things that we do every day. Right. Every day. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just like, yo, like, and as far as the rapping thing, like, you know, it's just extra content. Like, yeah, I, it's easy for me to write a 16. I can sit here and listen to a beat, write a 16. That's something I can give to y'all. Yeah, It's different than the poetry. So now I'm, ta I'm targeting a different audience. Right, so it's like okay, you, if you don't like my poetry, you might like my raps. If you don't like my raps, you might like my poetry. If you don't like my spoken word, you like you might like my written work. So it's just like widening that net. Um, and if you don't like none of that, you might just like me talking crazy on the grant. Like you know what I'm saying? Like whatever, like whatever's your bag, I got something for you. <laughs> like just widening your net, and it takes some time, bro. Like honestly, I've been on this journey for like three, four years. Um, where am I headed? That is the question. That's the um, question. That yeah. is the question. Um, I'm moving. I'm moving towards really trying to monetize what I'm doing, um, but then also being of service at the same time. Because it's like, yeah, the money is good. I, I feel like the money is good, but it's only great if you are helping. 
right? Because it's like what like what the Bible say, what good is it for a man to gain the world and lose his soul? And like I move off my soul. So if I don't have that, I'm stagnant, right? Like I can't even create at that point. Um, so just trying to figure out ways that I can effectively be myself and be of service and still make money off of it. Um, so what I have coming up now, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do this project, like the spoken word project that has visuals and put it out on platforms, but I also want to release this, release this book finally, you know what I'm saying? So hopefully I'm trying to do that before my birthday next year. I have it. I'm talking to some publishers. If they're not talking crazy, then I'm going to just self-publish and just put it out with some merch, you know, like you got to have all everything, merch, audio book, <laughs> you know what I mean? Actual physical copies and, you know, and get, and I have my core group of like poets and like entertainers who are doing that right now. You know what I'm saying? Cause it's a little tough for me cause I still have a full-time job in which, you know, I have a career. So it's like a lot of my time goes to that, you know what I mean? But I, I'm still pushing this thing because I already know like what my purpose is. So until my purpose could actually start paying my bills, you know, I'm gonna have to just do it part time. You know I mean, that's just where I'm at with it. And I feel like that's the creative, any creative, that's their struggle, right? Like, you know, I have this podcast, I've been blogging Eagle stuff for years. And, you know, I still have a full time job as an educator and working in education through talent. And so, you know, it's either you you go corporate and do this part time or you go full time with the struggle and hope that it pops. Right. But like mm-hmm. a lot of times what you see is that people that like yourself to have high integrity and are also service minded tend to take longer to get to that point where they where they really pop because they're not willing to sell their soul. And what you said about like your soul is your motivation like mm-hmm. that is arguably the most important aspect for me. Um, in regards to anything that I do, like if my soul isn't in it, if my heart isn't in it, if it's not innately something that, you know, I find a lot of value in, it's hard for me to continue forward with it. And so, you know, I respect you highly for the fact that you could have easily, you know, you, you have a great presentation, you know, I love what you said about product and developing product and how you think about this from a monetization standpoint is not just for fun it's because you want to create something that will last for a really long time that you can also capitalize off of right and like you're working from you you owning your your product you owning your masters you owning publishing and those sorts of things like you know when i talked to sharif for episode one and he talked about creating content and you know owning that content that's where we are Right. Like because of the Internet, because of the proliferation of social media, because we're such educated, intelligent beings that can, not like you said, create content in in a conversation. It's imperative that we keep it because we can make pennies or we can make dollars. Right. And like that is really on us. Um, And that's where I'm moving towards. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm moving off the gram by next year. Okay, I got the website already going. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm moving off the like because like. The gram senses you. You can't say certain things or whatever the case may be. So I'm just starting to leverage it. I'm gonna still have the gram, but like I'm trying to move the audience to a different place in which I can talk directly to them, right? right? Like, and you all know what you're here for. (laughs) You know why you came. So that's that's the goal. The goal is to like entrepreneurship, independent business, um, and still help. Yeah. still help people and those two I mean, things they don't have to be divergent right like they don't have to be different they don't have to be yeah. separate you you could hustle you could get after it and you could also still help people i think that it's imperative for us to help people and for us to give back and for us to oh. pay it forward and for us to when we see somebody like ourselves that's really trying to get a handle on the game pull them under tuck them under the wing and like listen you know i don't and i tell people straight from the jump i don't want anything from you what I want for you is for you to get to the point where you don't need me any longer. And then you find somebody else that you can help and you could pay this back to. Because in the end of the yeah. day, if that's not what we're doing, man, like, again, what are we doing? <laughs> you hit me with mad gems. I remember we was in Boston. You was, you hit me with something. See, I'm going to remember before we end this, I'm going to be like, yo, you hit me with something in that hotel room. And I was like, I had to go back home to New York and think about that. 
And I ain't even gonna cap, like, some of that's for my pops, bro. Like, some of them gems my pops really put me on. And he put me on it when I was 12, and it took me to be 32 to even comprehend what he said, because I also then had the life experience to experience. go along with it, right? Yeah. Like, you know, my pops sat me down and told me about prophylactic rubbers, you know, condoms when I was nine years old. And I was way before I needed to know that information. <laughs> when it came time for me to use it to be, you know, uh, safe sexually, I was ready. And so, right. you know, it, yeah. it's about planting that seed and, you know, letting it sprout and it'll sprout when it does. Right. But like it's, it's giving the word to somebody it's giving somebody that that something they can rely on and something that they could use. Um, and so you mentioned yeah. that your, your spirit and your soul is what motivates you. But what else motivates you? You know, what else keeps you going as you grow and as you're pushing towards creating your website, which is a priority? And, you know, in business school, I learned don't rely on social media. You always want to have your own website and your yeah. own hub because, again, it goes back to controlling your content and your brand. Yeah. So as you continue to push towards being that entrepreneur and being that that businessman, like Jay-Z said, as a businessman, right? You yeah. know, as you push towards that, what motivates you to keep going in those days where you're pulling those long work weeks, you know, your son is crying, you know, you, you might be riffing with your shorty. Uh, and, and you still got to produce content. You still have to find a way to dig deep in that soul to keep pushing. What, what keeps you going? So as far as the producing content thing, like, that's not hard. Um, that's not even something that I, like, that's not a struggle. Um, I can just produce content. That's not nothing. But what motivates me, honestly, is my son. I, what motivates me financially is my son. Because it's like, yo, he has to have... He has to be good. And not only good while he's growing up, he has to be set up. Like, we have to leave him something. And because, like, I know what it's like to not have that and to have to figure it out. And I have to, like, just be susceptible to anything because you have nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's just not a good place to be at. Um, but what motivates me as a writer is, like, I literally want to be the best writer in the world, bro. Like, I, like, I honestly... I have that braggadocious energy with me. Like, I really have, like, I really believe that, like, yo, nobody messing with my pen right now. Like, you know what I mean? And it's like, I know that people are better than me, but I know my taste level is higher than this. So if my taste level is higher than this, I know that I can be better than that. Because, like, I really spent my entire life reading and writing. Right. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, so it's like, I know what good writing is. I, I can do it easy. And it's like, I want to be better than my last poem. And that's really my competition. It's like, yo, my last poem was this. I liked it. It was cool. So like, what else? What's next? Like, I just want to be better. And it's like, I kind of lost that drive, honestly, especially with this COVID stuff, because it's like, my brain has been all over the place. Being in the house is kind of upsetting. And, like, just everything that we've seen on the news and, like, it wasn't until I actually did the Black Lives Matter protest where I got to perform that I, I kind of got re-energized because, like, I was depressed, bro. I was super depressed, like, with all of the situations that I got to see every single day on the news. And it, 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 it was trauma porn, bro. I was addicted to it. I would wake up and just look on, on CNN or Fox. I, I like Fox because, like, you got to know what the enemy is talking about. You know what I'm saying? So I will watch Fox and just be disgusted. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I'm I'm just now getting back into my writing process. I'm just now getting back to my waking up at four o'clock in the morning, jotting down my dreams, and then trying to organize it throughout the day into a poem. You know what I'm saying? I'm just now getting back to me. Because before I lost myself, bro, during this process, like I I really had a writing schedule for three years, bro. 10.30 to 12.30 at night, 4.30 to, like, 6 o'clock in the morning, every day, faithfully, writing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and then throughout the day, it, I read some things, but I'm writing every day. So it's like, you, you kind of gain that, that level of confidence when you realize, like, yo, this is the only thing I've been doing my whole life. You know what I'm saying? Like, that 10,000 hours is a real thing. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, I've given this more than that, and I can still get better. Like, I'm not going to limit myself to be like, oh, I'm the best that I can be right now. No, I'm not. I'm not even close, bro. And I know that. So it's like, that's why it's like, it's like a, it's like a rush, bro. It's like a drug. Like, I'm like, nah, like, I, I'll be the crib. Like, <laughs> like, having fevers, bro. Like, because this is not right. I can say that better. I can do this. And it's like, 
And I think one of the beautiful things about that too is because like I've been doing it for so long, I'm able to be like a mentor to like starting writers. I'm able to be specific in my critiques so that they can understand because like a lot of people can write well but don't know why they write well. And, and that's the difference. Like you have to know what you're doing before you start breaking the rules, right? So it's like, I can tell them the rules, like, hey, this is what you're supposed to do. Like, okay, this was a metaphor, but you didn't close the gap. All right, this was the, you know what I mean? Like, and then I'm a listener, I can tell them, and then I can explain it in a way that they can understand, because, like, literally, I just posted a poem today, my homegirl, um, she did, I had this order, uh, temporary lover series on Instagram, in which I'm talking about, like, dating culture, and Dating coach is temporary lover. Like, you you don't really date people for that long. Y'all talk for a long time. She wanted to do a part four. And she didn't want to do a part four without me, like, coaching her. And I was like, yo, I really don't like critiquing art because, like, that's not my thing. And I really like you. You're cool. I don't want you to be mad at me. Because, like, I'm not going to lie to you. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm going to keep it so funky about everything. And she was like, nah, I really need your opinions and I really need your help. And I and she she gave me the poem. I listened to it. I liked a lot of it. I liked a lot of it. And I realized certain gaps. And I was like, oh, I see what you're doing. I see what you're trying to do. I see what you, you know what I mean? And it's like, I hit her back like, hey, why don't you switch this line just a little bit? Why don't you, like, you know what I mean? Just a little bit. When I say, like, her poem, I posted her poem on my page. She did better than any of my poems, bro. <laughs> like, any of mine because like she's dope first of all that ain't had nothing to do with me but at the same time like i was able to like as a listener i was able to hear the gaps and be like damn i really wish you would have said this though like you know what i'm saying like i just love being able to like do the best job that i could do but also give back and like teach that's what we here to do anyway right you're listening to the third lap podcast with mal davis yeah, hundred percent, man. And it's important. Again, we we've talked about throughout this whole podcast that teaching aspect, and you know, helping people get better, which is imperative because you know we oftentimes don't really think about the impact that we have on somebody that's coming up behind us. And you know, why I love jazz so much is because jazz musicians master the craft before they start to improvise. And yeah. so that's how it gets real nasty is when you know what you're doing. And so what you said is so real is like, you know, put your 10,000 hours in, but know that 20,000 hours ain't enough, right? You got yeah. people on a 30,000th hour and they yeah. still getting better. You know, I told Sharif, my grandmother who, who passed when she was 98, when she was 96, she put me on and was like, you learn something new every single day. And at 96, she was still learning new things. And so that's like a hundred thousandth hour, right? Like, you know what I mean? She was so deep into the game that it set such a high standard and a high bar of expectation, of intelligence and of comprehension and of creativity that, you know, there's no point in which we ever should stop. You know, the time we stop is when God calls us home. And at that point, everything right. we did is going to be laid bare. And like, that's all we have left. And so of course you should be spending every opportunity that you have doing everything that you can to master your craft. And when I was growing up, it was a uh, jack of all trades, master of none. And, mm -hmm. you know, I used to always get hit with that. People were like, man, you're really good at a couple or a few things, but you're not a master of anything. And, you know, I always felt weird about hearing that. And then I got to where I am now. And I'm so happy that I spent time learning so many different things because realistically, especially in, in professional world, people that are a master of a single thing, Many of them are getting taken out through automation, and that's all they knew that's how to fact. do. That's was all they X, do. X, Y, yeah. or Z, right? And so yeah. when you can do X, Y, and Z, you can never be eliminated because yeah. if somebody takes X from you, you still have Y and Z, and you're gonna learn a new X. And so you know, I've seen you learn and adapt and create and continue to iterate on, and then now as you see yourself as a big homie in the game, teaching other people how to do that process. Not out of fear that they're going to replace you because you said you, you, you're a creator and you're a taste master. And so, you know, they can't do what you could do anyway. And so there's no reason to fear the next person 
where we should be helping that person, where we should be helping a, them get better. And that's a that's a low frequency energy. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, like I, I can't be scared of my brother or my sister at all. Like I want you to succeed. Yeah. I want you to go further than me because I'm still trying to figure this out. And once you get there, you can let me know. Right. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like that's <laughs> that's how I look at it. I'm like, yo, like whatever, whatever I have, I'll give it to you. And if you do something better than me, great. Let me know how. You know what I'm saying? Like, because I don't, I don't have that insecurity. I think, I think when people have deficits in their character, they get that insecurity. I don't have that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But no. they be, I don't like the fact that they be looking at me, I, I mean, like an old head, and I'm like, yo, I'm 31. Like, don't get it you, twisted. You're an old head, bro. I'm not I an seen, old head, bro. I seen I'm Twitter right. was roasting. What's that? Five year old foreign, the rapper from Brooklyn. He yeah. had posted something, and, and all the youngins on his drone was like, yo, you 30, you you better than that. You got to be yo, old that's now. And crazy. I was like, wow. Oh, and yeah. that, wow, I'm looking at it like, oh, so I definitely can't say nothing crazy. Yeah, other. bro, I be in poetry spots with 22 year olds, hey. and they be calling me OG, and I be like, wait, what? Where am I at right now? Like, hey, I still drink Maker's Mark and get 40s from the. Like, what are you talking about? I'm in the streets. Like, what are you talking about? But they don't understand. 30s and 20, they don't get it yet. So, and and once they get to this point, they gonna understand why. We are the way we are, right? Like, you know, some of the young younger people that I talk to and I'm looking forward to connecting with on this podcast, they call me old and, and you know, some of them joke I'm washed up and I'm glad to be washed, bro. Yeah, feel, that's, feel a good. that's a beautiful feeling. You know, I made it through a lot, bro. You know, we done survived a lot of things and, you know, it was never predicted that we would get here due to some of the things that we had to go through. And so- Like you still you know, here. That's it, bro. And celebrate the okay, moment. You know, we here and we shining. And so, you know, as we get to the, the tail end of this, um, I love to give people an opportunity. You you share so many gems and motivational thoughts and so many things that, you know, I can't wait to listen to and sit with. And, you know, when I share this podcast, I, I can't wait for other folks to interact with it. But is there any one thing or, you know, what's one thing or like one thought that you want to share that if no one heard or learned anything from this podcast, you absolutely want them to walk away with right now. If it, if I had to say one thing, and, and this is just what I tell myself every day, allow yourself space. Allow yourself space to, to grow. Allow yourself space to mess up. Allow yourself space to feel every single thing without judgment. Allow yourself space. Because we live in a world in which we're usually not granted that. So we tend to not do it for ourselves. And I know a lot of people that do it for other people. But when it comes to themselves, they don't hold space for themselves. So it's like, that's the one thing. I, if, that's my message in all of my poetry. It's just like, allow yourself that space to do whatever it is that you need to do at the time and only you know. That's my takeaway. That's it. It might not make sense, but that's just that's just where I, my head was at. Nah, bro, that makes perfect sense, and I appreciate you for it. You know that I think makes a lot of sense. And the tagline from this show, uh, from the podcast, is "Each one teach one." We all learn together. That what you just shared falls right in line with that. It falls mm-hmm. right in line with the whole concept of what the purpose of this is. What are you reading right now, Hat? Or what have you read? I'm I'm creating a book list that okay. I'm gonna share with the people, and so it's a third lap. It's going to be like a book club almost, you know. Hold on. I'm going to get it for you. I'm gonna Absolutely. So, um, in addition to the poetry works that I'm reading, because I'm I'm, I, I'm actually reading a lot of poetry books from, like, my peers. Okay. Like, because, like, you know, I show love, but I also yeah. love them as poets. Right. So, it's like I'm reading a lot of their works, like Cito Blanco, uh, Kira J, A Beautiful Mystery. I forgot the artist's name, though. But my girl, she just gave me this book called Stamped by Jason Reynolds. Okay. Right? And it's about racism and anti-racism. It's almost like in the education system though. Yeah. Um and it, and like I started reading that and you know, you know, I you know my history with the education system. So it's yeah. like, you know, I love stuff like that. So that's what I'm I, I just started literally like two days ago reading stamp. It's by Jason Reynolds and Ibrahim X. Kendi. Um Yeah, that's what I'm on right now. That's what's up. Shout out to your, shout out to your girl, man. You know, she yeah, like she, she always me on. yeah she always putting you on. She always holding you down. Um, and so shout out to her for sure. Big shout outs to your son for sure. Where can people find you? What's your show, social media? So I'm gonna post it as always. Like it'll be posted with the actual podcast episode okay. when it's released. But I also like to give you a chance to just shout out your social media. Where can people find you? 
Cool. My name is Hatches. It's like Matches with an Ace, but please don't sleep on me. And you can find me at I am underscore Hatches on Instagram. You can find me at Hatches by Boy on Facebook. You can find me at I am underscore Hatches on Twitter. I'm on all of those things. Um, the website will be up soon. Um, by that time, I'm going to start advertising on those. Just follow me on those places, and you'll get the directions to go to that other place. Though. Absolutely, man. And follow Hat. Yo, you know, it's been a pleasure following you and seeing your your growth and development as a professional and as a as an artist um and you know i will always call you an artist because that's what you are and i don't feel like you can be defined by anything else you're creative and you're an artist and seeing you grow and prosper as such has been just a blessing on my end because you know it, appreciate that brother i, I, I love that when i it. see people like you said low frequencies is hating on somebody and so you know it's a higher frequency to really celebrate the people that you love doing what they love and you know i got nothing but love for you i love you like you my brother and so yeah, to like see you, too, you continue to grow and aspire and, and you know as you evolve and you know five ten years from now when you really run in the game and, and i'm interacting with your son and i'm telling your son them little ratchet stories you be trying to hide from <laughs> him you know what i mean when you try to act different i'm gonna make sure you in line but you know That's when cool. you as you continue to evolve you know i've been able through social media to see that change happen. And so follow Hat. Hat is somebody that you absolutely want to interact with. You'll be hard pressed to find a realer person um, and find a realer, more authentic individual to be able to interact with regularly. Any final words, any last thing you want to say? You know, we, we down to like the last 60 seconds here. No, I, I just want to say I appreciate you. Thank you for, for having me. Thank you for creating this platform for people to just express themselves and talk their truths and get a game out you feel me like because that's that's what's necessary like we don't be having that like you creating a space to you creating a space to do what you do already bro because that's right. all you do with everybody you get a game out like hey i know this hey you should do this you know what i mean like so i appreciate you for being who you are bro i love you bro yeah, I love you too, man. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I get a chance to step back and let other people give game out for once, right? Because it gets tired <laughs> sometimes, you know what I mean? So I put everybody on. And I learn so much from everybody else too, right? You know, it's yeah. the whole learning process is a two-way street, whether you're a teacher and, and education or if you're just a person in real life. And as you build, it's a two-way street. If you're not getting as much as you're giving, then you're doing it wrong, yo. You know, you got two ears and one mouth, so you should be listening more than you talking. And so this platform gives me a chance to be able to curate and record the thoughts and experiences of some of the dopest people I know, but then also it gives me a chance to learn from them. And in this episode, I've learned so much about you and from you, Hat. And so, you know, it was my pleasure to have you on this show. Um, you know, like I said, it's, it's all about Thank each you, one, bro. each one. We all learn together. Uh, yeah, man, we're going to connect once the, once the pandemic is over. You know, I'm going to shoot up top. We're going to run around Harlem a little bit. Uh, you know, I can't wait to I'll, see a little hat. I might pull up on you sooner than you think, you heard? It's going to pop out. You know where we at. Yeah. All right, That's my right. brother. It's a wrap, you know, episode three of the Third Lap Podcast. Um, it's been a pleasure, hat. You too, bro. Be blessed. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Third Lap Podcast. This is your host, Mal Davis. Please visit the thethirdlappodcast.com for more information about the podcast, about our guests, and also to see our reading list. You can find us at the Third Lap Podcast on LinkedIn and Facebook, at Third Lap on Twitter, and at Third underscore Lap underscore Podcast on Instagram. If you know anyone that would be great to be featured on this show, please reach out to our host, Mal Davis. He's always looking for interesting people to learn more about them and to talk about their pathway. Thank you so much again. Have a good one.